Hi, I'm Dr. Ralph Levinson, Health Sciences Professor Emeritus at UCLA. And I'm Luc Levitansky, a French journalist covering technology, politics, and power. Welcome to Your Planet, Your Health, where we share stories about the environment without falling prey to despair. In these conversations, we explore the knowledge and tools that we can use to be good Earthlings. Okay, Luc, today let's talk about the oil companies and their lies. And to do that, we're going to look at a legal strategy that rests upon proving that the oil companies did in fact lie about the harm that they've been doing to the planet for decades. And we'll be delving into the historical record to prove it. So, one way in which climate activists stateside are really taking matters back into their own hands is by organizing a series of lawsuits against the oil company. Well, look, let me just interrupt you for a second. Remember, it's not just climate activists, it's governments that are suing. And so this strategy rests upon the premise of saying that the oil companies are responsible. People's lives have been severely impacted by the way in which oil companies have knowingly poisoned the discourse about climate change. Basically, you could argue they've hurt the species. They've hurt all of us earthlings to squeeze out their maximum profit out of what they could get in the short term. The legal argument to say that oil companies are on the hook for the damage that's caused by climate change implies that they knowingly misled the public about CO2's effect on the environment and thereby our survival. These lawsuits are trying to hold the oil companies responsible for the damage they've done. And part of doing this damage is predicated on the fact that the oil companies knew what was going on and that, you know, if it was inadvertent damage, there'd be no lawsuit. So the whole premise of these legal cases that are coming up in the courts against the oil companies is that they need to prove that there was intent behind what the oil companies were doing to mislead the public about the effect of their business on the survival of the species. And so I'm already getting uh, impassioned, as you can tell, but I think maybe you can explain in more detail the series of lawsuits, both the new case coming out of uh, California, right? And the other case of the multiple municipalities suing oil companies. Maybe you can give a little bit more clarity. Sure. There's been a couple of major developments in these last few months. First, in April of 2023, there was a Supreme Court decision that is really critical to this. Uh, basically, what happened is some 16 states and municipalities, this included places like Hawaii, appropriately for what just happened in Maui, that have had lawsuits going back several years. And the oil companies, to delay and have maybe a more favorable outcome, decided they wanted it bundled into the federal courts. Well, even this very conservative Supreme Court in April said, what are you talking about? You have no federal case here. There's nothing constitutional. This goes through the states. So that's a major, major win for the people who are suing, whether it's governments or environmental groups, because in this case, they have multiple lawsuits. Some might hit, some may not. But once a precedent is set, and that's what the oil companies are worried about, the other cases become much easier. Plus, there's discovery, right? You, when you do a lawsuit like this, you uncover what's there. You put it into evidence. And things that, as much as we know, and that's what we're going to talk about, there may be more that we don't know. Uh, there probably is. It's hard to believe we found everything out at, up to this point. Now, the California one is very recent. So this is another lawsuit we're talking about. There's, there's the municipalities suing the oil companies about knowingly misleading the public about climate change. And now there's California that is suing five oil companies. Exactly. This was announced on September 17th of this year, 2023. First, let's say, let's remember, besides that I live in California, why we talk so much about California. It's a major oil producing state. Everybody thinks, you know, Oklahoma, Texas, whatever. Yes, that's all true. But California is a huge oil producing state. So this is a big deal. And yes, they're suing Exxon, Mobil, Shell, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, BP, and the American Petroleum Institute, who we will be meeting several times in this podcast. And what are they suing them for, Ralph? They're suing them for money to pay for the damages that are coming up to adapt to what 
they did. Well, the lawsuit specifically alleges that all these parties have known since the 1950s that the burning of fossil fuels would warm the planet, and instead of alerting the public about these dangers, they chose to deny and downplay the effects. I mean, it's specifically saying the oil companies misled the public. That's the allegation of the lawsuit. That's what they're seeking damages for. Oh, absolutely. That's the only way you have a lawsuit. Otherwise, there'd be no case. Here, what they're saying is, you know, no, you hid. You you not only hid, but you got in the way, um, even knowing, even knowing what you knew. Now, one of the things that about these lawsuits, they may seem far-fetched are, are you know are we really going to hold the oil companies responsible well let's remember there's precedence for this major lawsuits and changes in our society for lead paint for tobacco these are precedents that really fit the case here so this is not just pulled out of some fantasy there is legal precedent for holding companies responsible yeah, these lawsuits aren't just about the vindication of being able to wag our fingers at these oil companies and be able to sort of hold our moral superiority over them and say, we know you were bad and you should feel shame. You know, that's ultimately a, a, a pyrrhic victory. The idea is that this would set a, a real precedence, as you're saying, as it did with these other industries. Exactly. And that's that's important. So the, the premise for these lawsuits, as you're saying, is uh, they depend on, on demonstrating the harm and also demonstrating the fact that the people who caused the problems did so knowingly. And so, Ralph, looking at these lawsuits, I think this is an interesting prism. Let's see to what extent, you know, these uh, municipalities and also California's uh, attorney general, do, do they have a case? Like, to what extent is it true? Do, do we know that the oil companies misled the public about what they were doing? To what extent can we say that the oil companies are responsible for profiting off environmental catastrophe? And therefore, can we say they're on the hook to pay back society and those affected? You know, what was the history of knowledge about the connection between oil, CO2, and the climate? Well, the answer is, uh, Duh, yeah, they, they have a great case because it's well documented and that's what we're going to talk about. Climate change, it's not like it's a truth that came down from on high. This is something we discovered, we observed it. Now, skepticism is at the heart of the scientific method, isn't it, Ralph? You're absolutely right. There's no question about it. Listen, doubt could be a good thing. We are supposed to question authority. We're supposed to doubt what we know so we can learn more. Doubt is absolutely needed in any honest inquiry of any kind, but it's baked into science. Yeah, I mean, the whole the whole concept of empiricism rests on the idea of falsifiability. That's what distinguishes science from dogma. That's how you know that it's the result of this earnest process of challenging, questioning and rethinking things. Because ultimately, manufactured doubt is very distinct from the process of producing science. You know, it's, it's moving away from earnest inquiry. In science, and in fact, in all honest inquiry, we need some skepticism, empiricism, falsifiability, we need doubt. But doubt is a double-edged sword. It can be weaponized, and we'll see that the oil companies did just that. Um, there was a point where there was some reasonable doubt, and that's not really been the case for really pretty much 70 years now. Right, and so we can see the extent to which the quest for knowledge in this area starts out, as most of the scientific process does, with experiments, uh, theories, tests, uh, discussions, you know, impassioned academic debates. So <laughs> perhaps you can give us a quick primer on the ways in which science first earnestly tried to wrestle with the question of climate change. Sure, I think that's totally what we should be doing here. And so let's start really early. Why did this first come up? Um, and when did it first come up? Let's, let's look big picture. The whole idea of changing climate, that wasn't inherent. We don't have a manual for Earth. And what, what happened was about 200 years ago, this scientist and mathematician in France, uh, Fourier, said, you know what? When you do the math and you look at the amount of sunlight coming in, the heat we're radiating out, we should basically be frozen. So why aren't we frozen? And he figured 
it was the atmosphere. The atmosphere was acting like a blanket. He didn't use greenhouse, but he did mention like a glass box. So he had that metaphor really early. When was Fourier writing these discoveries? Fourier was about 1824, so really 200 years ago. This is before the Industrial Revolution really took off. He wasn't talking about things that man was doing. He was talking about basically planetary science. Now, a little later, a scientist, a woman named Eunice Foote in 1856 came up with a very simple experiment. I, I love these brilliant, simple experiments. She basically put some water, some what they called carbonic acid then, and she noticed that the jar with CO2, when she put it out in the sun, got a lot hotter than the jar with anything else she put in it, including just air. Very interesting woman, lost to history really until about 10, 15 years ago. She was sort of rediscovered. She interestingly could not present this because she was a woman and not a member of the scientific organization she was presenting at. And so her husband had to present it, which had to really frustrate her because she was into women's rights even back at that early time. Well, a few years later, in 1859, John Tyndall, an Irishman in England, a much better known scientist of, of renown, did a series of experiments. He was kind of looking at sort of the molecular physics of this, and he's the one who gets the credit for demonstrating that CO2 has this effect of absorbing infrared and radiating heat. So three years after Uni's foot, yes. John Tyndall gets all the credit. Yeah, way the world. And now, in the 1880s, scientists were speculating about whether the burning of coal during the Industrial Revolution could affect the climate. They weren't exactly sure how. They disagreed with each other. I've seen a few letters in scientific journals where they really don't know exactly what it would do. Some thought it would cool some areas but melt the polar ice caps, which was prescient. So they had some things right and some things wrong. And they admitted they didn't know how or how fast, but they were bringing up the idea in the 1880s that our industrial revolution could change the climate. This is not new. Now, around the turn of the century, that is, you know, 1800 to 1900, it was coming into better focus. A scientist who was a physical chemist named Arrhenius uh, in Sweden, he really quantified this and really made predictions that the burning of fossil fuels would cause global warming. And he called it the hothouse theory, at least as it's translated. And a friend of his in 1901, Niels Elkholm, seems to be the one who first actually used the term that would be translated as greenhouse. They were writing in Swedish. Uh, so the greenhouse uh, idea goes back now 120 years. There were still some doubts. There wasn't that much known about the atmosphere. There weren't atmospheric and climate scientists like we know them now. And even Arrhenius was saying, hey, maybe this will take a couple of hundred years and maybe it'll even be good. Sweden will, you know, be able to grow more food. Well, in the 1930s, a couple of scientists had better data and they thought they were already seeing a bit of an effect. One scientist by the name of Hulbert in 1931 suggested that the amount of carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere could raise sea level temperature. And he also alluded, by the way, to Tyndall, as many other people had in the interim. And another scientist in 1938, Guy Callender, who was a steam engineer, presented a paper at the Royal Meteorological Society as a steam engineer. He was an outsider to this field. Calendar chimed in saying that, hey, I think we're already seeing some of this global warming. And as an outsider, he wasn't taken seriously by some of the scientific establishment. It wasn't, from what I can tell, very well received. But he was on track. Uh, well, and yet... He was passionate, right? This was a hobby of his. And he was building on the work of, as you mentioned, John Tyndall and Arrhenius. So he was... Exactly. He was building on this foundation. He was engaging with the science. Even though he wasn't initially taken seriously, his predictions in 1938, mind you, in front of the Meteorological Society, were on the mark. What did he say specifically? I think the fact is that as an engineer, he was probably a numbers guy. And what he said is, and I'm quoting in part, 
By fuel combustion, man has added about 150,000 million tons of carbon dioxide to the air during the past half century. Approximately three quarters of this has remained in the atmosphere. Now, let me add here, this is an important concept. CO2 takes a long time to go away, so it really accumulates. It takes as long as centuries to really go away. So he was pointing that out, that this is cumulative. Then he goes on to say, from this increase in mean temperature due to the artificial production of carbon dioxide it is estimated to be at the rate of 0.003 degrees centigrade per year at the present time. In other words, he was saying, hey, it's not a big effect at this time, but I think we can see this effect. And that's major. That is extremely major. And just to give a little bit of context, you know, when he's saying this, when, when Guy Callender is saying this in 1938, humanity collectively as a species, we're emitting about four gigatons of CO2, which is about 10% of what we put out last year in 2022. But the irony is he could see the trend already because in 1900, it was half of that. It was only two gigatons of CO2. So it doubled in 30 years between 1900 and 1930. And it's gotten, it's been multiplied by 10 since then. So his, his calculations weren't off the mark. He just rightfully saw that there was a correlation between increasing temperatures and CO2. He just couldn't guess that we would increase our production of CO2 tenfold in the intervening 75 years. Right. When you look at the curves of the kind of data you're talking about gigatons per year, it's, it really starts shooting up with the post-war reconstruction in the 50s and, um, and, and building roads and cars and, and all the industri post-war industrialization. It's not something that even Calendar saw coming. You know, he wasn't sitting there going, and I think in, you know, 15 years, we're going to have a post-war, you know, boom, and that'll be sustained and we'll have this new addiction and it's going to be much faster than I can possibly predict now. Yeah, yeah. The numbers got much worse. You know, in 1950, it went up to six gigatons. In 1960, it was nine gigatons. By 1981, we were up to 20 gigatons and up to the 37 gigatons of last year. And the rate of change had increased markedly. Uh, and, and of course, remember, it's cumulative. So any increase is there for the next, sort of like, uh, you know, compound interest. It's there for the <laughs> next, you know, the next iteration. So, you know, not, uh, we're still dealing with CO2 that was probably put in the air when Calendar was writing and talking. So that's putting Guy Calendar's predictions in front of the Royal Academy of Meteorologists into perspective. But now, he was talking in 1938, and something pretty major happened shortly thereafter. In World War II, people suddenly became very interested in weather. Weather became very important when you're talking about things like radioactive fallout. And then scientists and the community became much more aware that we really can change the atmosphere with radioactive fallout. We were much more powerful than we thought we were. Suddenly the skies and oceans didn't look quite as huge and infinite as they used to. And if you think about even the idea of the fallout of nuclear tests meant that it didn't take so much imagination to see these invisible ways in which humanity's destruction could mess things up. Stuff like radiation poisoning, uh, you know, the, the idea of pollution starts to take a lot more salience and it seems a lot less far-fetched to start thinking about humanity destroying itself at the time of uh, atomic weapons and mutually assured destruction. Nuclear fallout was invisible and it could kill you. So that added a dimension that the public started to really understand. There was no longer a question as to whether humans can alter things. And I think that changed the imagination and the vision. Scientists are part of, of a civilization. And when the vision of the civilization changes, the vision of the scientists change. You know, this was something that became part of the public discourse, part of the zeitgeist beyond just the scientists. So Gilbert Plass, now Gilbert Plass was a top physicist and he, was one of the first scientists I could find that was writing not only in scientific journals, but in the popular press. The first public media coverage on climate change I found was in Time Magazine in May 1953. Time Magazine reported on Dr. Gilbert Plass's presentation at the American Geophysical Union. The article quoted from Plass's presentation. 
in that he said that, and I'll quote this, this was in May 1953 issue of Time magazine. In the hungry fires of industry, modern man burns nearly 2 billion tons of coal and oil each year. Along with the smoke and soot of commerce, his furnaces belch some 6 billion tons of unseen carbon dioxide into the already tainted air. He goes on to say, the spreading of the envelope of gas around the earth serves as a great greenhouse. It's transparent to the radiant of heat coming from the sun. It blocks the longer wavelengths of heat that bounce back. And at its present rate, the atmosphere will raise the Earth's average temperature 1.5 degrees every 100 years. Now, that was a low ball. He actually increased his estimate in his 1955 academic paper to in centigrade, 1.1 centigrade per century, which is closer to 2 degrees Fahrenheit. Class increased his estimate again in 1959 when writing in Scientific American. I quote, if fossil fuel consumption continues to increase at the present rate, we will have sent more than a trillion tons of carbon dioxide into the air by the year 2000. This should raise the Earth's temperature by 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Exactly. So he was getting word out there. In 1953, Gilbert Plass, writing in Time magazine, is clearly wanting to make this public knowledge. He is trying to put this information out there. He was working as a science communicator. Clearly, he felt that this was worth sharing with people outside of his own field. He was clearly aware of the broad, species-wide implications of his findings, and he was trying to popularize this. Absolutely. That's right. So, also in 1953, at the same time Time Magazine was featuring Plass and his comments, there was an economist, a business consultant, named William Baxter. And he self-published a book called Today's Revolution in Weather. What it means to your business, your health, your stocks and real estate. So it tells you what the lens is. It shows his perspective. Your business, your stocks, your health and real estate. His perspective was, hey, we're already warming up. It's going to melt the ice. The oceans are going to rise. And in fact, it's a good business opportunity. <laughs> Just, you know, buy real estate in Canada and it's all going to be good. But he did acknowledge that climate change is a man-made. And he quotes Arrhenius and he quotes Plass. And he writes, man does it again. I am convinced that a good part of the increased heat is due to the activities of man. So this, this information was out there in the 50s. Well, it emphasizes this very business perspective. You can already tell in 1953, at the cutting edge of climate science, you've got on one end, the science communicators are trying to say, look, this is a big deal. And people like William Baxter are saying, this is a big deal. Here's how you should invest in accordance. You know, here's how you can plan. <laughs> right. Again, he notices that man is having an impact on the climate. And he's saying, as you said, like, here's how your real estate portfolio will be impacted. He's not thinking about like, Maybe there are things we could do to curb this or to try and mitigate it. It's more like, okay, no, let's adapt for us, for the types of people that he was advising. But now he did acknowledge bad things would happen, that the sea levels will rise and that's going to displace people. But this was an infomercial in effect for, I have this insight. Yeah, he had picked up on a trend that could influence people's investment decisions. And as we'll find out, some people's investment decisions were extremely influenced by climate uh, research. <laughs> uh, you know, the people on the that's inside, right. as it were. So maybe you can talk more about That's what was right. happening in 1959. While this was making its way out there into the popular post-war consciousness, what were the oil companies hearing about all this climate research? They may well have not read Time magazine, but I'll tell you that the first person in the post-war era that I, I really found in my reading that really called this to the attention of the oil companies was Edward Teller, who worked on the atom bomb and later is the father of the hydrogen bomb. He was very anti-Soviet. This was not a environmentalist. As a matter of fact, his real theme here is we need nuclear energy. And we could debate that. That's a separate podcast. But this is the first mention of oil companies being informed about the effects of their business on the climate, at least on the record. That I could find, yeah. Edward Teller actually spoke to the American Petroleum Institute about this in a conference called Energy and Man that was actually organized by the American Petroleum Institute at Columbia University in 1959. He laid it out. He said, guys, we got a lot of ice that's going to melt. This carbon dioxide, burning these fossil fuels, it's going to raise the oceans. I don't know how much. 
I don't know if it'll cover the Empire State Building or not. He actually said that. But let's listen to what he says. He says, carbon dioxide has a strange property. Its presence in the atmosphere causes a greenhouse effect. The result is that the Earth will continue to heat up until a balance is reestablished. A 10% increase in CO2 will melt the ice cap and submerge New York. All coastal cities will be covered. This is more serious than most people tend to believe. So in front of these oil execs, that's what he was saying. As I was saying, he was telling them, we got a problem here, and it's the CO2 we're putting up in the air. Uh, That's, again, 1959. This didn't fall totally on deaf ears, but it all seemed pretty far in the future, I suspect. And, of course, there was not a lot of motivation to change a really successful economy and business model. And then, in 1968, the American Petroleum Institute, again, actually got a report from the Stanford Research Institute. And so, wait, the American Petroleum Institute, they're just like, they represent the oil industry, right? Exactly. They're their trade organization. Thank you. Yes. And so in 1968, the... Uh... The Oil Trade Organization, the American Petroleum Institute, which, which will come up time and time again, got a report from the Stanford Research Institute. And in that report, it stated clearly that CO2 was a problem. Yeah, specifically the CO2 from fossil fuels are harmful to the planet. What the report specifically said about that is that the rising CO2 would result in increases in temperature that would melt the ice caps, cause rising seas and environmental damage worldwide. This is 1968. And I quote, none seems to fit the presently observed situation as well as the fossil fuel emanation theory. Now, remember, in science, theory is used differently. You know, the theory of gravity. You know, nobody doubts gravity. Theory is not like, oh, gee, I think maybe. Theory is something that is really substantial and is the best fit for the data. Yeah, the best way to explain. The best way to explain the phenomena is fossil fuels creating CO2 and causing potentially serious global problems. So this was a report commissioned by the trade organization for the oil companies, the American Petroleum Institute. And the Stanford Research Institute produced this report telling them that their activity, their fossil fuels, were emitting CO2 in a manner that was harmful to the planet. That's right, and the hits keep coming. Yes, Ralph, the hits keep coming. So meanwhile, what were the oil companies saying publicly? They had this good research behind the scenes, and publicly, After a 1969 oil spill off uh, Santa Barbara in California, which sent an estimated 3 million gallons of crude oil into the Pacific Ocean, the National Petroleum Council put out a report. They were commissioned to write a report by the US government, and so they did. And in this report, uh, (laughs) I don't think uh, you can say they gave a fair representation of where the science was at at the time. In the report, they wrote, and I quote, carbon dioxide concentrations do appear to be increasing for reasons not well understood, and the scientists would have to wait until the year 2000 to determine whether or not a serious problem even exists. So contrast this between what was happening internally within the American Petroleum Institute in 1968 versus what the oil companies put in their official reports for the government and for public consumption in 1972. You can see the contradiction is clear as day. And it goes on. As far as the rise in CO2 levels, they said the problem was just simply not well understood. So again, This was pretty cutting edge science. Things were still being uncovered. And I think it's very interesting to see Exxon's reaction, obviously was not to publicize this, but while this was bubbling, Exxon themselves invested in research. They started hiring their own climate scientists to look more into, you know, what is our business doing? And they weren't doing this, again, out of the goodness of their hearts. They were thinking about what are the potential market evolutions? They were actually trying to get ahead of the government in this field. So flash forward to a decade later, there's been some uh, recent reporting in 2015 by Inside Climate News that shows the internal record, what the oil executives were saying internally. And so some internal communications from Exxon have been revealed. In this case, we have internal communications from the summer of 1977. The senior Exxon company scientist, James Black, James Black had been working at this time over a third of a century for the oil companies. And he was a senior company scientist. He was an oil guy. And he wrote to his uh, bosses at Exxon 
In the first place, there's general scientific agreement that the most likely manner in which mankind is influencing the global climate is through the carbon dioxide release from the burning of fossil fuels. And he was telling this to Exxon's management committee directly because he was a senior company scientist. He was reporting up to his management and saying that we are influencing the global climate through the burning of fossil fuels. Exactly. And then in 1978, so the following year, he wrote, present thinking holds that man has a time window, hear this, of five to 10 years before the need for decisions regarding changes in energy strategies might become critical. This is a senior scientist from Exxon in 1978 saying, you know, by the end of the 80s, we better have a plan in place. Exactly. And he was internally to Exxon executives stressing the importance of this, again, only because of a concern for the bottom line. This was coming from a culture in Exxon that was cautiously examining potential threats to their business model. And since their revenues depended on oil and gas extraction, they had to be hyper vigilant about potential policy changes. And so Exxon scientist Henry Shaw wrote that the rationale for Exxon's involvement and commitment of funds and personnel is based on our need to assess the potential impact of the greenhouse effect on Exxon's business. So again, this is internal scientists saying, we need to see what the effect of our activities on the climate is, if only because it's gonna have an impact on the business. Now, again, Henry Shaw, this um, senior scientist within Exxon, wrote a memo in November 1979 to his boss, Harold Weinberg, and he said, we should be prepared for and ahead of the government in making the public aware of pollution problems. So you clearly see internally here, Exxon is thinking, it's as soon as this information about fossil fuels and climate is gonna get out, people are gonna go nuts and the government is gonna take action. And this is why Exxon was so strongly investing early on in research around the climate because they wanted to get ahead of government action. More from the 1979 memo that Henry Shaw wrote to his boss advising internal Exxon company strategy. He wrote, It behooves us to start a very aggressive defensive program in the indicated areas of atmospheric science and climate because there is a good probability that legislation affecting our business will be passed. So here you can clearly see internally the strategy of Exxon is spearheading research so that they can own the discourse, so they can own the conversation ahead of the public and ahead of the government. And so this is November 79. You know, there were employees who later said that that Exxon, interestingly, really wanted to understand about carbon dioxide levels because there was a corporate culture of farsightedness, but then they really cared in terms of risks to its bottom line. Exactly. This was a form of market research. Interviews with former Exxon staff revealed that this culture of farsightedness wasn't coming from an earnest spirit of scientific inquiry, like we could say Guy Callender was doing back in the 30s, you know, as a hobbyist meteorologist. In this case, the, the Exxon scientists were being put to, to research these ideas about CO2 and atmosphere and climate, not out of some desire to further the science, but because of a dogged commitment to protecting the bottom line. So you have to look at it as a form of market research, basically. How can we protect our investment in this very lucrative sector of oil extraction? And that's the motivating factor behind the research that uh, Exxon was commissioning all the way back into the 70s. And as our further findings will reveal, this did in fact motivate Exxon to act, perhaps not in the fashion that one might have hoped, but they certainly took this research to heart. They did not ignore it. And the irony is, if we look today, the predictions that they made back in 1977 were eerily accurate in terms of the level of temperature increase. They had very good science at the time, and obviously they were aware of the pressing need for action. And so it's all the more painful to see that there was a turning point and a real decision that could have been made by Exxon's management at that point. And uh, well, in a way, they did make a decision. So about 50 years ago, the scientists that Exxon hired accurately predicted how badly their own activity would end up leaving us right now. Absolutely. They knew the stakes for all of us. 
And it wasn't just Exxon. The American Petroleum Institute had a task force from 79 to 83, and they monitored and shared research. So there's this period where their science was very good. Some of it was even published in academic journals. And as you say, their models were very accurate. So what did Exxon do? Did they say, oh, we better change our business model. Maybe we could go into other forms of energy and that type of thing, change who they are, help out the civilizations that support them. It wasn't just passive. There was an active decision made not to pursue this. The fact is that there were members on that API task force that apparently were open to the idea that the oil industry might have to shoulder some of the responsibility for reducing CO2 emissions. And they may have to change their refining processes. And they may have to develop fuels that emitted less carbon dioxide. Well, I guess you could guess that, no, that's not at all what they did. They basically uh, made a decision to bury this material. And then Exxon put out a internal corporate primer in 1982. Exxon wrote a memo for internal use only. This was marked not to be distributed externally. However, it was given wide circulation amongst Exxon's management. So this goes back to the claim that Exxon knew this information, were part of the uncovering of it, and very quickly were part of the concealing. As soon as they found out, they figured, oh, this is not for public consumption. So in this 1982 internal memo, Exxon's researchers came to the conclusion that Heading off global warming would require major reductions in fossil fuel combustion. Unless that happened, there are some potentially catastrophic events that must be considered. What their response was, and I love this, was to say nothing to the public, this was internal, and cut funding for research. <laughs> that, that was their response. The whole history of climate research is inexorably tied with these companies whose business is dependent upon extraction of fossil fuels. And they quickly pivoted from being at the forefront of funding climate research to being at the forefront of concealment and denial. And so Exxon starts in the 80s creating this alliance of the world's largest fossil fuel companies called the Global Climate Coalition which was trying to halt government efforts to curb fossil fuel production. So again, sounding very innocuous, you know, the Global Climate Coalition sounds like a very legitimate institution. Yeah, I'm ready to send them money right now. <laughs> yeah, who wouldn't, right? The, the Global <laughs> Coalition tackling on climate issues. Now, what they were tackling again was spreading fear, uncertainty and doubt on these issues so that they could push a denial movement. It was created to oppose mandatory reductions in carbon emissions. It was something to give lawmakers a tool to do the oil company bidding. And they also used the American Petroleum Institute and right-wing think tanks, such as the Marshall Institute, to disseminate these arguments for doubting the link between burning fossil fuels and climate change. And the Marshall Institute definitely cherry-picked their data. It's well-documented. And the Cato Institute, which is a libertarian think tank, which is also funded by the, the oil industry uh, family, the Koch brothers, used this distorted data that the Marshall Institute published. So stop and review that for a second. The Marshall Institute cherry-picked data. The Cato Institute quoted them, so they become this echo chamber. You see, they're all saying it. It's more than an echo chamber. They're giving each other legitimacy by giving the imprimatur of these, these big institutions saying, look, it's said by this person, this institute. And, but ultimately, they're just laundering the same piece of manufactured, cherry-picked evidence in order to purposefully try to sow doubt in the debate, basically. They're trying to create the impression of a vivid debate where there was none. Right? You're totally right. These are groups that are meant to confuse the public with very benign sounding names. This is not, hey, we're the oil company and this is what we have to say, you know. And I'd even go a step further because by having different groups do this, groups with these very benign neutral names, it looks like well, it's more than that. You know, it's like very official names like the Marshall Institute, you know, the Cato Institute. These sound like serious institutions. They do, don't they? Absolutely. It says nothing, but it says, but it sure comes off like... Uh, it sounds old worldy. It sounds, <laughs> it sounds fancy. There's something about it that sort of sounds like an old society, you know. Uh, and, and ultimately, yeah, it's, it, these are just oil front groups. An example the Union of Concerned Scientists gave was quote, California Drivers Alliance, unquote. 
that's the name of a group. Sounds perfectly innocuous. So does Washington Consumers for Sound Fuel Policy. Who doesn't want sound fuel policy? But these organizations were secretly run by the Western States Petroleum Association. And Luke, this is the basis of why people want to hold the oil companies responsible. It's not that they can say, well, we just didn't know that there'd be these harms. It's documented. So oil companies are commissioning researchers of extremely high quality, it turned out, but uh, that uh, was not being used in a good faith inquiry. It wasn't in the spirit of science, as we were talking about. So here's just for a little bit of a breath of fresh air from all this disingenuousness. Here's a British <laughs> documentary. This documentary was broadcast in December 1981 on ITV, on British television. And so in this clip, you'll hear two voices. You'll hear first the voice of Tom Vernon, who was the presenter for this ITV television program. And then you'll hear the climate scientist David M. Burns. And basically, You'll hear that the public discourse, for those who were willing to pay attention on climate issues, was actually becoming quite advanced in 1981. Odorless, colorless gas, produced when we burn fossil fuels, petrol, gas or oil, in the engines which power our world. It is called carbon dioxide. Since the time of the Industrial Revolution, man has consumed huge and increasing amounts of fossil fuel to sustain the growth of industrial societies. When fossil fuels, which contain carbon, are burnt or combusted to produce energy, the carbon combines with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, CO2. Meteorologists now believe that increased quantities of CO2 in the atmosphere will lead to a significant warming of the planet within decades. Great technology bestrides the planet. But the need for energy so central to our society, is threatening to alter the climate of the globe. We're talking about a fundamental alteration of one of the givens of the globe that we inhabit, caused by man himself. The call for restraint in a society built on the exploitation of energy may meet irresistible forces. There is, for example, the vested interest that many of the world's great corporations have in fossil fuels and the power they can wield on their behalf. Now, I don't know if you could quite make that out at the end. I tried to clean up the audio as well as I could. But the British presenter, Tom Vernon, in 1981, was telling us, the call for restraint in a society built on the exploitation of energy may meet irresistible forces. There is, for example, the vested interest that many of the world's great corporations have in fossil fuels and the power they could wield on their behalf. Well, now... You can hear just how clear the implications were of the connection of burning more fossil fuels and raising temperatures. But it goes to what you were saying. This is kind of like mind-blowing that this was just by 1980. Why were we still circling the drain? There was a committee formed for the National Academy of Sciences in 1980, and they called this committee Changing Climate. And they did have top scientists, but somehow there were also two factions in gathering this report. There were the scientists who were really concerned, they really wanted action, and there were the economists. Most National Academy reports are written collectively. They're reviewed by all the committee members and then reviewed again by outside reviewers. But that didn't happen here. Specifically, the Carbon Dioxide Assessment Committee could not agree on an integrated assessment. And so they settled on individually signing and authoring the chapters. And it just so happened that the two chapters by The Economists were the ones that were the introductory chapter and the conclusion chapter. And then the five <laughs> chapters contributed by the natural scientists, you know, the expert in the field in terms of what actually the phenomenon was. Those were sort of sandwiched in the middle. So The Economists had an approach that emphasized delaying, sort of assuming that there would be natural technological solutions that would emerge as the sort of the market will cure it all. You know, there was very much this ideology within the economic profession at this time. And so it's very interesting that none of the physical scientists suggested that we should simply wait and see. And yet this was the only conclusion that came out of the report. You know, the meat of the sandwich, as it were, was completely dismissed. You are absolutely right. And indeed, the New York Times wrote that the committee found there was no politically or economically realistic way of heading off global warming. Now, that's not really what they found, but that's the message they got. 
One of the most prominent voices was an economist named Thomas Schelling. And this is this guy was, was no slouch. He's a very respected, serious economist who actually later won a Nobel Prize for his work on game theory. And so let's look at the way that Thomas Schilling, who is in charge of the economic side of the report, wrote about this issue. He insisted it would be a mistake to assume a preference for dealing with causes rather than symptoms. His conclusion was that emphasizing causes rather than symptoms was a mistake. It would be wrong to commit people to the principle that if fossil fuels and carbon dioxide are where the problem arises, then it must also necessarily be where the solution lies. So it's essentially saying that they shouldn't be looking at the causes. They should only be treating the symptoms, you know. And I think as a physician, Ralph, you might have a, a, a word or two about this philosophy. You know, is this, a, is this an effective way of treating uh, people? Well, sometimes it's the only thing you can do. It's true. But... In fact, well, like end of life care, uh, sure, and then some other things, but the, the, you know, chronic some chronic diseases and so on, th diseases that we don't know the cause of. But I don't think anybody would treat appendicitis with a painkiller and not go to the root cause, which is an inflamed, possibly necrotic and infected appendix. So. If somebody has appendicitis, you don't give them a couple of aspirin and say, come back in the morning. You know, you do surgery. And any time you could go to the root cause, you know, it's the old, I mean, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's, it's just a basic principle in medicine. You go to the root cause when you can. It just is amazing to me that they, anybody would, would argue this. Now, that's not to say that you don't address symptoms. There's a lot of either or thinking in these kinds of fields, right? Oh, we either do A or we do B. Well, you know, sometimes you do A and B, you know, and, and sure, take care of the symptoms, you know, worry about floods, do what you can to adapt. But anytime you could go to the root cause, it's always more efficient. So yes, yeah, so this, this just makes no sense. And that's how he set a big part of the narrative. I mean, the historians. Exactly. Historians who wrote a wonderful book called Merchants of Doubt, Oreskes and Conway, speak of this as being a pivotal moment. The publication of this report in 1983 changed the terms of the debate, right? Absolutely. Oreskes and Conway are quoted as saying that this report, quote, arguably launched the climate change debate, unquote. And the way it did that is by making it a debate when there really wasn't one. There was no scientific debate. As you said, Luke, the report was music to many powerful ears. The scientists did listen as well, and they did continue their research. It didn't change policy in the 1980s, but they continued their research. The issue really heated up again in the later 80s because a couple of things happened. One was the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In 1988, the United Nations created the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And then in 1990, they produced a report. This really upped the ante because this was now international news. And another was James Hansen testified before Congress. For over three decades, James Hansen was the director of NASA's Goddard Space Institute. That is to say, he was the head of research for NASA on climate issues. He testified at a hearing before the Committee on Energy and Natural Resources of the United States Senate. James Hansen said that the expected global warming is of the same magnitude as the observed warming. Since there's only a 1% chance of an accidental warming of this magnitude, the agreement with the expected greenhouse effect is of considerable significance. Altogether, this evidence represents a very strong case, in my opinion, that the greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate now. The global warming is now large enough that we can ascribe, with a high degree of confidence, a cause and effect relationship to the greenhouse effect. So basically, he sounded the alarm in front of the Senate. And there was also a memo from Exxon again, our favorite memo producers, in 1988, where they explicitly said, emphasize the uncertainty, right? Now, look, previously we said that the scientists suggested, uh, Hansen, that Oh, it's a 1% uncertainty. And this is one of those things, is it 99% full or 1% empty? You know, and in science, we 
essentially never talk about 100% certainty. Yeah, it's a question of probabilities. But the question is, what uncertainties are you talking about? Are you talking about quibbling about, eh, maybe there'll be some more modifying effect from clouds. Maybe we need to, you know, we need to fine tune this or that observation, but not uncertainty as to whether it was happening. What you have in this 1988 internal memo from Exxon is the clear outlining of this strategy, this bad faith reading of what is a natural fact of science, the presenting of probabilities and uncertainties, and trying to twist that to imply that things aren't as sure as they are. It's a twisting of the science for nefarious ends. And you can see that the internal memo says, like, the science shows the greenhouse effect is real, and what we need to do is emphasize the uncertainty, as you say, like, basically, try and muddy the waters, try and make it impossible to actually get the truth. You know, as the public is getting informed about this, Exxon's move is to put PR out there to confuse people about how clear it was that climate change was a real thing by emphasizing this 1%, the uncertainty. Recent reporting by the Wall Street Journal in September 2023 uncovered even more of Exxon's behind the scenes reactions to James Hansen's alerting the public about climate change. Frank Sproul, Exxon's head of research at the time, sent a memo to his colleagues also in 1988. And I'm quoting, if a worldwide consensus emerges that action is needed to mitigate against greenhouse gas effects, substantial negative impacts on Exxon could occur. Any additional R&D efforts within corporate research on greenhouse should have two primary purposes. One, protect the value of our resources, oil, gas, coal, to preserve Exxon's business options. And as for NASA's James Hansen, the one who initially sounded the alarm about this, how did he react to all these efforts? Well, you know what? Let's hear it directly from him. He was interviewed in 2014, reflecting on his testimony and the tactics of those who were inconvenienced by it. In the 1980s, after I testified, I decided to bail out of the public aspect of this problem because I was very uncomfortable in that role. And I thought, as the story becomes clearer, we will then take the actions that are needed. By the year 2000, it had become so clear that we were not doing anything. The science has become so clear. The things that we predicted are actually happening. We know as much about how the climate works as doctors know about how your body works. The scientific method is you have to continually reassess your conclusions. As soon as there's new data, you ask, well, how does that affect my interpretation? And you're open-minded. What we're up against is people who have a preferred answer. And so then they take the position of a lawyer. They're going to defend their client, and they will only present you with the data that favors their client. By 1988, this was clearly getting out there. And as a response to this, oil companies felt a need to start communicating. Now here, we're going to be taking a listen to a clip from Royal Dutch Shell from 1991. And here you'll see their acknowledging the reality of climate change in their promotional video. But let's hear what their bright solutions were. To combat global warming does not mean scrapping an entire way of life. But it does mean changing public perceptions and attitudes to its extravagances. If everyone switched to the new low energy lights, cities the size of New York, Moscow or Bombay could each cut over a million tons of carbon dioxide emissions every year. Perhaps this clip is sort of also illustrative of the limited imagination of the solutions proposed by these companies. Again, that was a Royal Dutch Shell in 1991 talking about um, light bulbs being the panacea to any potential issue we might have with the climate. Just, just buy more efficient light bulbs. <laughs> it's deflection. The light bulb issue is deflection. The oil companies don't have to change. What are you guys, the consumers, going to do? So, going back to this two-faced approach to public relations that the oil companies were having all the way into the 90s. Now, going back to our good old friends at the American Petroleum Institute, the API, uh, its president, actually, Charles D. Boner, who actually joined the Institute after working for Richard Nixon in the 70s as an energy policy advisor. So the president of the API, Charles D. Boner, 
said during the API's annual meeting in 1996, he said, you heard the claim that a scientific consensus on warming now exists. That is beyond misleading. It is dead wrong. So the president of the API was saying there was no scientific consensus on climate change all the way out in 96. Even worse, actually, he compared climate models to Ouija boards. He said that this is junk science, this superstition. The president of the API was trying to misrepresent what the nature of the scientific discourse was. Remember, this is in 1996. So be that as it may, they started really using some of the deniers for hire. This was their reaction to the IPCC, right? And the better science. The front groups for oil decided to bring out the attack dogs and up the volume on denial. Let me quote from the book, The New Climate War, by the climate scientist, Michael Mann. He says that there was a conference that he considered the very first known climate change denial conference. This was done in June 1991. It was titled The Global Environmental Crisis, Science or Politics. And this was funded in part by the Koch brothers, who were an oil industry family. One of the people who was part of that was S. Fred Singer, who Michael Mann calls a denier for hire. He was part of the attack dogs for the tobacco companies trying to fight regulations. He was busy trying to cast doubt on acid rain and the solutions for acid rain. How do you think he slept at night? <laughs> uh, on a very comfortable pillow, because <laughs> he could afford it. Fred Singer was actually interviewed in 2014. Let's listen to his frustration as he is reminded that he was a so-called expert for big tobacco before moving on to climate denial. I still think that the EPA has cooked the data on secondhand smoke. I'm uh, annoyed <laughs> by the fact that this tobacco business comes up every time uh, when I speak about global warming, which has nothing to do with tobacco. Well, and this goes right into the research that Oreskes and Conway have done. You can see this is the same yes. tactics that were employed by the tobacco industry before them and the chemical industry. Exactly. That's the point. And not only did they use the tactics, they literally used some of the same supposed experts. It's funny how an expert who isn't really a scientist in these fields can be an expert on tobacco chemicals and atmospheric sciences, but they sure could if you paid them right. Yeah, and the oil companies had a huge Rolodex by then that had been well established <laughs> yes. from these uh, deniers for hire, these fake experts that you could put out there. They'd sound very serious and they would confuse the public. The oil companies knew who in their Rolodex would say what they needed said. Yes, and ultimately these people were usually handsomely paid. This is not conjecture. Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the oil companies' payouts were substantial. For instance, there was $1.2 million to an aeronautic engineer masquerading as an astrophysicist, Willie Soon, between 2005 and 2015. During this decade, he published at least 11 articles denying that climate change was caused by greenhouse gases, but never disclosed that he was funded by big oil. That's a major academic sin. In his correspondence with the fossil fuel companies, Willie soon referred to his papers and testimonies as, quote, deliverables, unquote, for them. Essentially works for hire to the tune of $1.2 million. So this is the price tag that they put on these deniers for hire, these fake experts that we're talking about. More recently, a historian of science at Harvard, Jeffrey Supran, who has worked with Oreskes, estimated how much money the oil companies paid to manipulate public opinion and political activities. And Jeffrey Supran found that in the last decade, the oil companies paid over a billion dollars on PR firms and advertising companies. So... One example of what this money bought uh, the oil companies is what they did in their communications. So here I thought this could be an opportunity for us to actually take a look at what these oil companies' money bought. You know, what did they pay for? You mentioned advertorials. An advertorial, it's a, it's a cute word. It's a portmanteau between advertisement and editorial. It's basically 
an advertisement that's meant to be disguised as editorial content. So an advertorial is a way in which a company can camouflage an advert inside of a newspaper by making it look like an article that mimics the font, not unlike what we today call sponsored content. And anyways, back in the day, you know, while we have all this plethora of documented communications of what the oil companies were saying internally, we see that they were spending untold amounts, over a billion in a decade, on PR and advertising. And so we thought it could be quite interesting to see what this money was actually buying. Like, what were these ads saying? And there's a series of advertorials from 1991 that I thought were quite striking. Now, the front group that the oil companies used in this instance is called Informed Citizens for the Environment. Again, a front name. It's a complete shadow group. Just it's a way for the oil companies to funnel their money. And what were some of the things that this uh, 1991 Informed Citizens for the Environment ad campaign said, Ralph? One of the ones I really like is a one that's a picture of a, a frenzied chicken and the headline is, who told you the earth was warming, Chicken Little? Calling environmentalists Chicken Littles in 1991 is pretty bold from the company that was directly suppressing this information yeah. at the time. This is part of how they suppressed it, by trying to make people seem alarmist. It's the idea of panicking for no reason. and. It is probably not a coincidence that 1991 was right after the first IPCC report. You know, they knew exactly who was telling us this. The international scientific community. Yes, it's a, it's a defense strategy. This was a reaction. They were trying to stall the public finding out by actively pushing out this information. And they were aided and abetted by news publications like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, which were totally willing to mislead their readers by publishing these advertorials by the oil companies disguised to look like editorial content. So this is one example from 1991. We also have an example in 1997. They took out a series of advertorials urging the president not to sign on to the Kyoto Treaty, the environmental treaty. The front group that the oil companies used this time was called the Global Climate Coalition. It looks like a United Colors of Benetton ad. It's like a multiracial <laughs> picture of children and it's saying, don't risk our economic future. Please don't sign on to the Kyoto Treaty. This 1997 advertorial arguing against the Kyoto Treaty goes on to say, we still don't know what role man-made greenhouse gases might play in warming the planet. The science of climate change is too uncertain to mandate a plan of action that could plunge economies into turmoil. Committing to binding targets and timetables now will alter today's lifestyles and tomorrow's living standards. And he goes on to say, carpooling in, sport utility vehicles out. That's to say, carpooling in, SUVs out. They also were trying to frame the debates. There was a series of advertorials taken out by ExxonMobil presenting the situation as unsettled science. And this looks just like a very serious article. It has a graph in the middle and everything about it is trying to portray the science of climate change as uncertain. This is also in coordination with the PR campaign that the oil companies pushed around ensuring that President Bush would not sign on to the Kyoto Treaty. And they were successful. Ironically enough, the Bush White House specifically cited these advertorials as being a turning point in influencing their decision to ultimately pull out of the Kyoto Treaty in 2001. It's very interesting to look at what the oil companies said to the public and what they said in more internal communications. So Oreskes, and Supran, our historians of science, wrote an article in 2017 where they looked at this pretty much the same period. Uh, in this case, it was 1977 to 2014. And they found that four out of five of internal documents acknowledged that climate change is real and human caused. But only one out of nine of their advertorials acknowledged that. And as a matter of fact, four out of five of these public facing advertorials expressed doubt. So there was a clear choice of language. And the way uh, Supran and Oreskes summarize this is, and I'm quoting here, 
They have used the rhetoric of climate risk and consumer energy demand to construct a frame that downplays the reality and seriousness of climate change, normalizes fossil fuel lock-in, and individualizes responsibility, which, as we know, we saw that individualizing responsibility in that clip we heard about light bulbs earlier. This idea of deniers for hire brings to mind a clip from a June 2023 interview with uh, another Naomi, not Naomi Oreskes, uh, the author of Merchants of Doubt. This, this is Naomi Klein, uh, a big thinker around the climate justice movement. Right. And so she infiltrated uh, a conference of climate deniers. She went in person and she investigated what the climate deniers were saying to each other. And the truth is, it none of it had to make sense. And this is a fascinating thing. So there's a, there's a little clip that I excerpted from an interview with Naomi Klein in which she gives us a window into the minds of the types of people who were hired to be professional deniers for the fossil fuel industry, uh, trying to uh, sow doubt. And, and yeah, she talks about the, uh, the Claremont Institute, which is uh, not unlike the Cato Institute or the Marshall Institute. You know, it's one of these fronts these places are about creating false evidence. And the truth is, it doesn't even have to be internally consistent. That's the maddening thing. You know, we, we started this talk with thinking about how does the scientific process work? What is knowledge? You know, these very epistemological thoughts about how do we get to know the things that we know? And here are people who are actively just making a mockery of the process of academia and science. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Because the only goal that they have is to make sure that the business model of the oil companies never gets called into question. I think if we listen to Naomi Klein right here, she will outline in extremely clear terms what the motives behind these types of investment decisions by the oil companies are. I say let's listen to Naomi. <laughs> this is the strategy, you know, doubt is our product um, borrowed from the tobacco you know industry by the yeah. fossil fuel industry and you know where you really see it is the heartland institute which a lot of these guys are associated with a lot of these so-called like dissident scientists right so the, the, the heartland institute is a free market think tank quote unquote free market um, that hosts this annual climate change denial conference i've been to it um it's insane um, it's people like this who get trotted out to just just sprinkle doubt around. It's all it all contradicts. Like you'll have one person say climate change is happening, but it's not that bad. We can just get air conditioning, and then there'll be somebody else who says like it's sunspots, and then there'll be somebody else who is like you know an, a, a retired astronaut who's just like it. You know it's not happening. Things are actually getting cooler, and somebody else says like carbon is good for you, you know, like it's, we're going to have more plants and it, and there's no attempt to resolve any of it. It's just like, let's throw stuff at the wall to confuse people. I'm trying to grapple with the idea of all these people being in the same room and talking to each other like they believe what they're saying. It's a lot of old men, you know, and they're like, there's like a lot of hobby, like weather hobbyists. And there's just mm -hmm. like a real small handful of actual scientists, all of whom are funded by fossil fuel companies in one way or, or another. And I think it's a bit of an ego trip, right? Because they published this rival IPCC report. <laughs> so you have this oh, they did. IPCC report is thousands and thousands of scientists all kind of aggregated. And it's, it's actually very conservative because when you collaborate on that scale, it's going to round down to, you know, the, the most conservative estimates of outcomes. And also it has to be approved by government. And so they changed like one letter in the acronym so that gets sort of confusing um but oh. the main thing to understand is like the heartland institute is not a scientific organization it like they, their goal is just to like impose austerity and privatize public services and then what they realized was that climate change was a huge threat to that you know far right kind of chicago school economic agenda because you do need to regulate you do need you know, you need governments to be able to govern. <laughs> and so their whole project of dismantling the public sphere is threatened by the reality that we are actually overheating the planet and endangering the support systems for life on this planet. And that means we actually have to like intervene 
in a pretty forceful way, which makes their heads explode. So they found like the three scientists who will say it's not happening so that they can, but that's not the goal. The goal is not science. They care about the implications of the science because all their other stuff then is, you know, falling apart in their head. The science of climate change is real, right? And that actually you need right. government and all of their scare tactics around socialism and the rest of it you know, become a lot less appealing, I would argue. So there you go. I mean, you have it right there. That's, I don't think these people believe their own BS. I think these are very cynical actors, just as you said, trying to exhaust our capacity for critical thinking and making people check out. It's not hard to be pretty cynical about it. I was just reading in a book about somebody whose father-in-law said, the Democrats just paid all the scientists in the world. And there was no way he could be budged from that. He seemed to really believe that. But he didn't He didn't come up with that thought out of nowhere. I mean, this is where That's my, true. my You're moral right. outrage in this issue comes from, is that the only reason we are at this point is because they have spent untold amounts of resources to make people like that guy who believes that every single scientist is paid off by Democrats. I believe this. Preach, brother! <laughs> exactly. They were basically just exaggerating and lying this in 1997 the ceo of mobile lee raymond he questioned whether the earth was warming at all because scientists had predicted a new ice age he claimed which was not really true uh in 2001 exxon mobile had a press release quote there is no consensus about long-term climate during the 1970s people were concerned about global cooling uh senator inhofe famously took 2.3 million dollars from the oil and gas industry and he claimed oh no the scientist was far from settled in 1970s we were warmed about cooling in 2004 the exxon backed cato institute alluded to this claim so we see a pattern be that as it may exxon claimed to have stopped funding climate outright climate deniers in 20 2007 well, do they want a medal or something yeah, exactly. You know, thank you. Yeah, and that's what they'll admit to, because here goes the work of investigative journalists. Obviously, more payments were found to a climate denier directly from Exxon in 2010. Actually, if you want to figure, um, going back to our good old pals from the API, the American Petroleum Institute, you know, in 2015, the API spent an estimated $65 million on funding climate denial efforts, you know, so in spite of them claiming that they'd wash their hands of such things. This is according to the Center for Public Integrity. In 2015, the API spent an estimated $65 million on climate denial efforts to delay action on something that, bear in mind, it had known about for over half a century by then. And of course, they didn't stop there because sure, we've talked about these climate groups that were really oil company groups, the funding that went into these advertisements and public statements, but it went deeper than that. It went into buying politicians. That's where a lot of their money goes. And of course, uh, that's a really big deal. So OpenSecrets.org recently uncovered that in 2022 alone, the oil and gas industry spent 125 million on federal lobbying. So not only did they have record profits, they also redirected a lot of the uh, surplus value that was extracted by their workers into directly misleading the public further. You know, they spent 125 million within a year on lobbying. That's directly trying to influence legislation, trying to poison the discourse through legal ways, but again, back channel ways. If you're thinking about why are prices so high at the pump, you know, those margins for those oil companies go directly towards funding all this lying to try and push their agenda through the legislature. Then again, gas prices are heavily subsidized in the US, so it's more like these PR efforts by oil companies are indirectly being funded by US taxpayers. Again, these things are very valuable to these oil companies. Remember, they spent $125 million within the last year. And this was helped a lot in 2010. The Supreme Court decided to go with Citizens United. Yeah, basically lifted any spending caps on federal elections by allowing people to uh, funnel their money through side organizations such as super PACs. And so long as you did not directly claim coordination, 
you were able to, um, you know, funnel extremely high amounts of money into the American electoral system. And you can see since Citizen United, the spending has ballooned. And oftentimes, especially in local elections, whoever spends most uh, wins. Obviously, thankfully, that's not always the case. But there is a, a right. huge glut of wasted money that goes through the American federal election system as a result of the Citizens United decisions. Massive amount of money is pouring into campaign consultants. And this is largely aided by the use of these shadowy organizations and side groups that was permitted by this 2010 Supreme Court decision, the Citizens United uh, court case, which you're quite likely familiar with. Consultants were handsomely paid to come up with this language and put it in the mouths of very serious people. You know, th this is a purposeful tactic that, you know, I'm thinking back, you know, it's like, oh, it's too costly to change. Well, you know what? It costs them a lot of money to come up with all these consultants and these strategies and these talking points. You know, they could, that money could have been used. <laughs> yeah, but it was still a good buy. It was... <laughs> it's, a, it's a drop in the bucket compared <laughs> to what it would actually cost them to change the business model. Yeah, it's a drop in the bucket. But now, the oil companies really give most of this money to Republicans. They know who's going to speak up for them, who's going to be obstructionist for them in the halls of Congress. Yeah, Republicans are reliable on that, but it's it's more than just Republicans. That's true. You know, we keep talking about the Republican Party being at fault here, but actually I think some of the people who are most liable to be bought in this happen to be on the, the other side. I mean, this is a, truly a bipartisan issue in terms of oil money corrupting politicians. I think Joe Manchin, who's been a, a swing vote uh, on a lot of issues for the Democratic Party, he's the number one uh, senator who's taken the most oil money in 2022. He took $768,000. You know, from these companies. Manchin, this senator from West Virginia, was on the top of the list at seven hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollars. Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, has been an infamous thorn in the side of climate activists for a long time, including with the latest IRA bill. It was his uh, waffling that ultimately extracted concessions from the more uh, ambitious parts of Biden's climate agenda. So. As you're saying, this was a return on investment for the oil companies because he topped the list of donations for senators in the United States Senate by oil companies. And in 2022, the oil companies donated to Joe Manchin at the height of $768,000, three quarters of a million dollars. So it was one quarter shy of a million dollars just in the pockets of Joe Manchin directly well, somewhat shadily, indirectly sometimes, from the oil companies into his pockets. And he's been a good soldier for this money, you know. He's been very good at obstructing Biden's climate agenda. And he's ultimately, the reason why he tops the bill above all the Republicans is because he is the one where the return on investment is greatest because of his unique position as sort of the pivot vote among the Democrats. He's very necessary and useful to the oil companies. And that's why they're willing to invest so much into his um, good fortunes. And obviously, it just so happens Joe Manchin personally is quite heavily invested in the coal industry. And so he personally stands to benefit a lot from uh, sort of protecting its... Uh, oh, no, and his family is, there's no question yeah. about it. And there was, he's not the only Democrat taking money and who has been an obstruction. Cinema from Arizona got $214,000. She took this money as a Democrat and was also a barrier to having as aggressive a climate uh, legislation as we could. Undoubtedly. Uh, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to demonstrate a direct quid pro quo to think that, you know, there might be something to do between, you know, them handsomely rewarding him every year and him doing policies that just happen to directly get in the way of anything that would inconvenience these companies. You know, again, on their end, it's a very reasonable investment. 768K isn't that much. And cinema is up there in the top 10 of um, senators who receive the most money from oil, up there with 214K herself. So, you know, she's, uh, she's also making a pretty penny off her very public waffling on these issues. And, and one has to wonder if this isn't, uh, if there isn't sort of a, a causal link here between these well, things. It's hard to believe there's a coincidence that they were the ones who basically torpedoed a lot of the legislation that the Democrats tried to get through to control climate change. And they were responsible, and particularly Manchin, for some of the compromises 
that had to be made. Absolutely. Yeah, caving into the demands of industry, yes, which were particularly being fought for by these people who just happen to receive a lot of money every year from the industry. They've been very influential, buying politicians, left and right. This is the truth of American politics, you know, money has been dominating and, you know, there are ways out of this. But there are different campaign funding systems and there are different ways of, of thinking about getting elected and it's certainly very encouraging there are organizations like justice democrats that are primarying conservative democrats who are bought into these interests and oftentimes doing so with less money but with grassroots activism and people who actually care about what they're doing this seems like re-engaging the activity of politics and taking it away from the hands of these oil producers i mean i think there are real ways of resisting and i don't mean to imply that all is lost but I also don't think a, a Manichaean narrative that implies that uh, the good guys are on one side and the bad guys are, are all in the Republican Party is going to help us be wise and hip to the nefarious strategies that oil companies will use to uh, distort, delay, and doom us all. Well, that's a, that's a very important discussion. And your basic premise is absolutely true. Uh, oil money does not always know red from blue it's there's no question about it ultimately i have little faith that the democratic party as an institution wants to fight this tooth and nail in the way that it needs to be fought but i do know that they're the only of your two political parties that can be pressured into fighting this i don't want to be apologizing for mansion he really was instrumental in putting some very bad things in the ira but he did ultimately help us get it through. I certainly wouldn't want him to change into being Republican with the same negatives, but without at least being willing to work with the Democrats. At least you can work with these people. At least they can be pressured. That's, that's the distinction. At least to some degree, not as much as we'd like. Now, besides buying the politicians, and remember what we're talking about when we talk about this three quarters of a million dollars. This is just part of it. There's much money cycling that's not through these lists that we get, you know, through the American Petroleum Institute and through private families. This doesn't count the Koch brothers. They were oil barons. It was a family owned company. Politicians, this isn't their only source of money. There's a lot of money going to politicians at every level. I think a mindset that keeps coming up as these oil companies pivoted away from explicitly trying to fight the denial fight was a move towards portraying any action on climate as too coercive, which was on full display in 2013. In 2013, there was um, a board meeting uh, from the oil company ExxonMobil, and uh, the CEO of the company at the time was Rex Tillerson, whom uh, Trump later appointed to be Secretary of State. You know, in 2013, Rex Tillerson, who we many of us may know because he was the Trump Secretary of State and he was the CEO of ExxonMobil. You know, I mean, choosing an oil man to run foreign policy in the US was its own sort of big signal that the conservatives were sending in the first place. But I think he really embodied this this shift in sort of trying to make climate change, if they weren't going to try to have us disbelieve it, they're going to try and make the whole thing seem way too inconvenient. Obviously, the oil companies would find it inconvenient for them. Rex Tillerson said, and this is a quote, what good is it to save the planet if humanity suffers, unquote, meaning oh, you know, you're going to suffer if we work on this issue. And well, that's the euphemism. Humanity suffering, you know, this quote wasn't a public statement, obviously, it wouldn't have been that bold. This is, right. you know, when back when Rex Tillerson, before uh, Trump sort of uh, swooped him uh, in 2017 to be American Secretary of State, he was running ExxonMobil, the oil company. And during an internal shareholder meeting, it was leaked that um, in response to considering uh, the question of climate change and whether or not they should do anything about it, he said, what good is it to save the planet if humanity suffers? Surely, yes, humanity suffers here is a euphemism for slightly making the very wealthy oil executives uh, inconvenient. <laughs> slightly less richer. And even then, we're talking about, like, you know, that third house in Malibu. Damn mm. it, maybe not. Maybe they can't buy it. Oh, well, they'll, they'll, trust me, they'll be able to still buy the house in Malibu for a long oh, I time. I know, I know. Well, nothing <laughs> happened. They didn't have to change anything. Wait. His whole premise is putting in opposition these two ideas, uh, even though they're 
intrinsically linked this false dichotomy that was set up by Rex Tillerson uh, at the ExxonMobil shareholders meeting in which he said that he did not think that it was worth tackling climate change if humanity had to suffer. So again, it's making this assumption that the only way in which we can address our climate crisis is human suffering. But that's getting the equation completely the wrong way around. Now we know billions of people will suffer because of climate change now. Now it's a question of scope and extent, but already the cat's out of the bag. Here we are, and let's not forget that lots of people are already suffering from climate change and from air pollution. You know, so humanity is already going to suffer because of this. Now, the suffering that Rex Tillerson was talking about in that 2013 Exxon shareholder meeting is very different. He's talking about the suffering of a tiny class of exploiters, a tiny class of executives who take the extraction of this resource and who have profited massively of it. You know, you can't take that little grain of truth that it will be painful to undergo transitions and ignore the fact that already millions of people are suffering even now and it's just going to get much worse no matter what we do the best we could do is make it not get much much we worse. can mitigate it there are real things that we can do we, we, you and i will never fall to despair or doomism here this is not what this right. is about it's it's very much on the contrary it's about animating us to see the mechanisms of power that got us to this place and then to empower us to think about other ways of organizing right and i think the the reason why this rex tillerson comment sticks out is because it's so calculated to drive a wedge amongst climate activists the shift in messaging towards the inconvenience of mitigation of climate change is, is a devilish one because it's an appeal to selfishness. And ultimately, people are so atomized in our society, it's very hard for us to think about collective action problems like climate change, you know? We're already thinking about like, how am I gonna make ends meet? How am I gonna like put food on the table by the end of the month? How am I gonna pay these medical bills? Well, I wonder about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, there, there are a lot of stresses on individuals in society that make it impossible for us to look at the bigger picture. And that's, again, completely by design. Now, you know who is looking at the bigger picture? The ExxonMobil shareholders. But I think this goes back to this. It's very interesting if you think about it. It's there is no alternative in that framing. There is no thinking of like, oh, the government right. can massively subsidize public transport, create EVs. There are many ways in which it doesn't have to be painful for individuals. I mean, currently your government has decided to subsidize uh, people's purchases of electronic vehicles as a way of trying to move people away from fossil fuels. And that's that's certainly a nudge among others. But I think I would argue it's, it's small pickings, although I'm not opposed to uh, these efforts. I think they are an insufficient well step. Partially because of the work of people like Mansion and Cinema, who took out some of the strongest provisions out of these bills. I mean, that's, oh yeah, that's they definitely took... design. Those carve-outs are the direct result of the investment of those oil companies in it's the right. uh, campaign funds of these politicians. So I think that's that's why I want to draw these these links. Is we do not have to suffer in order to tackle climate change. In fact, the government has ample money that it uses to subsidize oil companies that it could use to subsidize greener solutions. And this is a political choice that's being made, uh, just as uh, Obama's choice was to massively expand fracking. You know, we, we can't discount the ways in which American politics has been under the thumb of big oil for decades now. It's funny to hear you use the uh, under the thumb uh, phrase, uh, which I, I agree with. And I had recently been listening to some, a presentation by Al Gore and he used that exact same phrase. He said, the politicians, and, and it was, and, and, and he grimaced and used his thumb, pushing down, like pushing hard down on a button. The politicians are under the thumb of the oil companies. So Al Gore agrees with you, let me tell you. Yeah, I think he encountered those people because he was also early on these issues. I'm sure he did plenty. The fossil fuel industry is the polluted heart of the climate crisis. For decades now, the companies have had the evidence, they know the truth, and they consciously decided to lie to publics all around the world in order to calm down the political momentum for doing something about it, so they could make more money. Another interesting reaction by Exxon CEO Rex Tillerson came from an internal memo that the Wall Street Journal uncovered in September 2023. Now, Exxon's reaction to 2015's Paris Accords externally was to play along, but internally, 
they made fun of them. Rex Tillerson is on record dismissing their target of limiting warming to two degrees as magical thinking. And he sarcastically added, who's to say two and a half degrees isn't enough? You know, why stop at two? Again, deriding the very concept of countries getting together to try and tackle climate change. Now, I'd like to remind you that all this was the result of deliberate choices. Oil doesn't take itself out of the ground. The climate doesn't warm itself. None of these are natural processes. Right. They're the direct results of continued actions by individuals. And I don't think the individual holding the pickaxe, I don't think the worker is deciding where we're mining, right? These decisions are ultimately made by a very small number of individuals who happen to be getting very wealthy off the status quo. <laughs> Well, before we start the French Revolution here... But putting in, in the opposition this idea that we must suffer uh, is really only looking at it from the perspective of oil executives. And uh, some of these oil executives, you know, before these lawsuits came to bear, there was a real moment where um, their heads were in the spotlight. You know, Congress, in October of 2021 to be specific, Congress convened the heads of Exxon, Chevron, Shell and BP, British Petroleum, to ask them some questions about their role in climate disinformation. This was a hearing specifically trying to get oil executives on the record about the fact that they knew and lied about climate change and their role in it. It was Democrats trying to hold the oil executives' feet to the fire. They were trying to get oil executives to admit that they lied and that they are harming the environment. So the head of the hearing, Coma, asked each oil executive if they'd ever approved a disinformation campaign. And they all repeated, oh, no, 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 I know of no such thing. You know, they all kind of had their denial ready to go. And they were very sophisticated. They were prepared. And the Democrats didn't get much traction, especially the American oil executives just lied. They just denied very sophisticated, very smooth. That's why they make the big bucks. That's why they make the big bucks. We do have a, a soundbite here from Naomi Oreskes, who was commenting about this. And so let's listen. We'll hear the preeminent scholar in this field. You've heard her name quite a bit up to now. It's Naomi Oreskes. We can finally hear her voice. Naomi Oreskes, a prominent historian of science, is the one who wrote Merchants of Doubt and then worked with Jeffrey Supran on this research about the internal communications of oil companies, specifically Exxon. And so here, let's listen to her talk as the preeminent scholar on this very issue. Let's hear her comments on what this hearing of oil executives in October 2021 in the US Congress yielded. So this is her reacting on cable news right after the hearing, and you'll see, she was not impressed. <laughs> so let's literally hear her voice. We know from my own research, the work of other academics and investigative journalists, that for more than 30 years now, the fossil fuel industry has promoted disinformation, half-truths, and in some cases, outright falsehoods about climate science in order to confuse the American people and undermine support for climate action. And if we're subject to a bombardment of disinformation and propaganda, it makes it extremely difficult for us to understand even what kinds of policies could be effective. And we saw that today with a lot of tap dancing by the fossil fuel executives about low carbon and reduced carbon and carbon intensity, none of which is a meaningful solution to the climate crisis. The two most effective things that I think experts agree on that Congress could do tomorrow is to eliminate subsidies for fossil fuels and put a stiff price on carbon. The fossil fuel industry is heavily subsidized. Uh, independent sources estimate that direct subsidies to fossil fuels in the United States alone are at least $20 billion every year. Globally, those direct subsidies are at least $650 billion and that does not include the indirect subsidies in terms of the unpaid health costs or the cost of military protection of oil and gas shipping lanes. So the fossil fuel industry is a hugely subsidized industry. And so one thing that Congress could do beginning tomorrow is to phase out those subsidies so that renewable energy and efficiency could compete on a level playing field. And this is something that the industry has opposed over and over again. They say they believe in free enterprise, and even today, they are fighting to continue to maintain those subsidies. The fossil fuel industry makes billions of dollars in profit, and we are left with tens of billions of dollars in damage from floods and fires and hurricanes. So we can fix that 
and as I said, virtually all economists agree, by putting a price on carbon. But it needs to be a stiff price. Ralph, what did you think? First of all, she's brilliant and she's right. She's certainly right about the subsidies. Carbon tax is a complicated issue. Uh, some people are concerned it's a regressive tax. Although I, th- I think it, it was it was totally right on the money. The oil executives remind me of, you know, mafia dons, you know, the heads of mafia families. They could keep their hands clean. Oh, no, I never said we should do this. They don't have to say it. They just have to fund the people, the PR groups, the special front organizations to do the dirty work for them. However, what we do know is that there's plenty of documentation that the oil companies have done this. And watching these oil company executives dance around and hide the truth was just insane. These guys really felt like they had control because they did, because they were just lying. Now that's not gonna be so easy in the future. It's beyond comprehension how clearly these executives shows profits over truth. It's a form of death cult, sacrificing lives for money. And the issue of oil lies is critical now as these lawsuits use them as the basis for them. Let's just put this into perspective. The only reason that we all experience this is because of the very concerted decisions by a group of executives. They have really made it that we've lost decades of action that they knew need to be taken. And maybe we can think about how sometimes wealthy interests try to manipulate the truth. And uh, this is evidently, as we have (laughs) documented through our meticulous uncovering of research and internal communications through the decades, we have seen oil companies have knowingly lied. They've hidden the truth long after they know it. You might call this a form of gaslighting. And they manufactured doubt. They (laughs) exaggerated minor uncertainties, all the while making a profit at the expense of our collective future. And this is really the point, you know, the driving force behind these lawsuits rests on this idea of to what extent do we know that oil companies knew what they were doing and profited off it. And I think after having spent about an hour with us going through this, I hope that uh, you will come with this fired up and enlightened uh, about the uh, nefarious ways in which the companies will stop at no end to try and stall uh, efforts to be regulated. There's a lot of reasons to phase out oil. They want us to do it as slowly as possible. They want to maximize their profits and their longevity. Lawsuits are a way for them to be held responsible. At least the oil companies will be confronted in public on the record with their misdeeds and lies. <laughs> well, on that note, Ralph, we certainly have the elements for putting together a strong case about the ways in which oil companies lied to us. And we have reasons to be hopeful that more of their deceptions could come to light with these types of court cases. And ultimately, I am very hopeful. As you've said, it's been a long road to get us to understanding these things. And it's been an arduous road because roadblocks have been put in place by oil companies who've tried to, you know, blind us from the truth. And it's important for us to understand the choices that led us to this point. This has not been the result of natural processes. These are things that we are doing and that we have been discovering. And we would have gotten there a lot faster if it wasn't for these dastardly oil companies getting in our way. Uh, and on that note, uh... <laughs> yeah, okay, let's let's on that note. Uh, well, in our next podcast, Luke, we're going to stay optimistic. We're not going to just continuously dwell on these people and their evil deeds and their mansions <laughs> and their mansions <laughs> and their wealth. We're going to keep positive, and we'll take it from there. Anyways, if you like this podcast, you know uh, we are not sponsored by anyone. We are very impassioned about what we talk about and we are not corrupted by any financial influence unlike (laughs) uh, some of the people we've talked about but to that end if this is something that you liked if you found this valuable if you want to spread this review us on your podcast app of choice so whether you're listening in apple podcasts in overcast in pocket casts wherever you choose to listen to us so if you want to be part of this conversation please reach out to us and spread the word you know again 
putting it so that the robots and the algorithms can see that you liked it is one step. The next step you can do is send it to someone you care about. You know, if someone that you know wants to know more about the history of uh, the ways in which oil companies have lied, you can just be like, well, do you have an hour? And do you like the sound of a British guy and a New York person <laughs> arguing it out? And you could share our gleeful, righteous indignation with them. And on that note, Ralph, uh, <laughs> this has been quite a ride, but uh, I hope you stay planet and stay healthy. Thank you, Luke. I'll do everything I can to do that. <laughs>